Hi, good evening or uh, afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm calling in from Trondheim in southern Sápmi, Norway. And my name is Stephanie Hessler. I'm the invited curator of this year's Momenta Biennale, which I've curated together with um, the curatorial team of Camille Georgeson Usher, Maud Johnson, and Himali Singh Soin under the title Sensing Nature. And it's great to have the chance tonight to um, tell you a bit about the exhibition and show you some images of the works installed in Montreal, where uh, this is actually the last, uh, yeah, these are the last 11 days to see the exhibition in person. Um, I will share my screen to show you some of the photographs from the exhibition. So with Sensing Nature, um, we began by asking ourselves, how can we approach nature in a way that is not as exploitative and based in knowledge that is being created through categories and through trying to grasp and fully understand in order to largely exploit, uh, which is what we've been used to in the European enlightenment uh, way of approaching nature. But instead we focused on sensing to really propose that there's another way of engaging with nature, which is based in the sensuous, the sensory and perception and, uh, and not only in the brain, but in, of course, the brain being part of our bodies and in all sensations uh, that we can create through embodied knowledge and world making. We also consider the title Sensing Nature as twofold. So not only as humans sensing nature, but nature also sensing back and being an active other that, uh, that has its own capacities of sensing, which we may not understand as humans, but which nonetheless give it uh, all rights of existence and uh, which doesn't mean that we need to uh, respect or protect it any less. The Biennale considers environmental justice as closely connected with social justice. And with the focus on sensing, we don't propose to go against science or against you know, analysis and forms of knowledge creation that uh, which are very important clearly, as well as activism. Um, but we say that it is important to have these other approaches and these other ways of, uh, of getting closer to nature and of vibrating together with her. And so the exhibition and the artists showing in the exhibition invite us to forge these intimate kinships uh, with nature, with humans and non-humans, with land and with water, with organic and biological beings as much as with uh, technology and synthetic beings. So this notion of nature is also contested and you know, it's not natural as such, but always connected to culture, always connected to technology and to, uh, to change, be that through humans or through other beings. And uh, together with the curatorial team for the last a uh, year and a half, we've worked closely together, largely on Zoom actually. Um, and we did a lot of studio visits with artists all over the world, among other places, of course, in um, Montreal, Munyang, Tirtake, as well as uh, all over Canada, we had an open call where uh, 400 or more uh, people submitted proposals of which we selected a few also. Um, and we did studio visits with other artists from uh, Samoa to uh, French Guiana and uh, to Puerto Rico, France, all over the world, really. And in the exhibition, in the end, we ended up working with around 50 artists with our partner institutions. And so the way that Momenta works is that each exhibition is proposed to a partner institution and it needs to work for their program as well. So it was interesting actually to look at all the wonderful, really interesting and diverse institutions in uh, Montreal and to think about what we can propose and what might make sense for their audiences 
And um, I think it is really gives the biennial a local anchoring, which I think is really important. And it brings in various audiences. So for us, the curatorial team, it was also really important to think of an exhibition and feel an exhibition which really can speak to a lot of different people and where there's a lot of different entry points. And so I hope that uh, this comes through also in the images of the exhibitions. We're starting with the exhibition of the land at the Galerie de Lucam. And the exhibition of the land really starts thinking about, okay, what are our relations to land, um, both through extraction. So we're looking, for example, at mining on indigenous land, but also at what I mentioned earlier, these nature cultures. So culture or nature not being separate from one another, but really informing one another. Um, and one of the examples that we thought about was an urban fox who is sort of strolling through a, through a patch of metropolitan land or through garden and, you know, disappears behind a trash can. And so, you know, this kind of um, relationship between what we consider natural and what we consider human made is really um, at the core of this exhibition. We also don't consider land as separate from water at all, but we, continue, we consider them as one continuous uh, entity and, and, and entities that co-compose and co-inform one another. And so the premise of this part of the exhibition is really to say that uh, this sort of we, which is uh, very different, of course, I mean, it consists of humans and non-humans, uh, again, of living and non-living entities or what we consider as living and non-living in the uh, traditional sort of Western sense. Um, but it also acknowledges that the we, even in the human sense, is very diverse. So we're not all the same we, right? And it's also important to acknowledge that the um, impact of some humans makes itself felt more on land than those of other humans. So namely, it's mostly the global north and industrialized countries whose impact on the land is felt, whereas those who absorb this negative impact are mostly uh, racialized, uh, poor, indigenous, um, and indigenous people. So the first work that one sees when entering the exhibition space is by Carolina Caicedo. It's one of the works from her water portrait series. And here we see the first sort of um, questioning of this idea of what is actually land and can we really divide land from water? These water portraits are sort of Rorschach-like images. So you can see in the center, they're mirrored and they refer to visions by healers that Carolina has worked with in the past. Um, they have photographs taken of different parts of land and water, and they undo the Western art historical landscape format, which has a very clear you know, frame and this sort of this horizontal landscape format. And in this case, it's this elongated, beautiful long fabric, uh, which stretches all through the space. These pieces of fabric can also be worn. So in performances, Carolina and performers actually um, submerge these fabrics in water and they interact with it. So these are active landscape portraits. They're not just there for contemplation, but they involve us humans as viewers, uh, but they also involve us as performers or as active entities in relation with land and water. The artists Sema Igaras and Erin Sedal visited the Great Bear Lake um, in 2019, where they conducted research on the ongoing effects of uranium mining in the 1930s. The mining served the construction of nuclear bombs during the Manhattan Project. And so during their visit, Fema and Erin did interviews with people, mostly of Dana communities, who live on the shore of the lakes, many of whom were employed in the mining industry. And so here we see um, a sign that's in the shape of a government warning sign telling people about radioactivity in the area or telling them to keep out. So it's sort of an image of statecraft in the area uh, with a photograph printed on fabric hung over it. 
And in the back on the right, you can see a shape of a sort of a monument, a monument perhaps to the impact of state power on indigenous communities. In front, you can see um, these rocks that the artists collected on the site, which emit very low radioactivity. And they're encased in these glass bubbles, both to protect us from radiation, but also to protect the rocks and to tell the, the history in a museological manner um, of the uranium mining in the area. Kamala Magrel is a poet, uh, artist, filmmaker from uh, Mauritius, living in Montreal. And their project here is based in the postcards uh, exoticizing uh, racialized and feminized bodies uh, that tourists would, uh, would buy in Mauritius. Um, and together with this work, we show a video projection on the floor, which, um, in which Kama is seen interacting with salt. So salt as an element that is both found in our bodies, but also in the ocean. Um, and which uh, can both be, it can both crystallize and it can also be liquid and dissolved. And so this fluidity or um, change, possibility of change is really important to Kama's practice as they also uh, work a lot with what they call Zomfam, which is Mauritian Creole for man, woman or trans and non-binary uh, identity. Together with the video on the ground, we show these uh, fabrics with, with uh, drawings or paintings um, of sort of archipelago-like shapes, referring to the island of Mauritius, uh, as well as to, um, to archipelagos uh, all over the world and how we can reconsider our thinking through the archipelago in a sense of uh, people like Edouard Glissand, uh, the uh, late poet and writer, um, but also how we can reconsider our ways of thinking from being so land-based to actually focus on water and asking what would it mean if our ways of thinking were much more based on water than on land. Here's another close-up of the video, which is projected onto salt. Um, again, material that can crystallize and be liquid and also salt was uh, mined or extracted in uh, Mauritius uh, there was a traditional uh, salt manufactory uh, on the island. Taloha Vini's three video projections uh, called Habitat 2017 document an abandoned mine in Papua New Guinea where the artist is from where uh, copper was mined. And now we follow a woman whose name is Agata. She's looking for gold in the abandoned, uh, in the abandoned mine. We see the, uh, the destroyed ecosystem. And there are also in some other shots, uh, maps laid over the images where one can really see the, the mining claims and how the land is distributed among companies. So here again, the relation between humans and nature is one of transaction and one of uh, essentially destruction, but also the attempt of living on a ruined planet as, uh, as Anat Singh would say. Eftang Ni's project for the exhibition is a new commission as is actually Kamala Makrel and also uh, Thema Igaras and Aaron Sedal, the latter of which we co-commissioned together with the Toronto Biennial, but I will come back to that later. In the case of Ev, she's been researching roses and uh, rose, uh, the rose industry, beginning with the term English rose, which in Victorian England refers to a beautiful woman of fair skin. And so Ev is looking both at this term as well as the history of rose trade, where roses come from, the roses that we, uh, that we can buy in the global north, for instance, come mostly from Kenya and Ecuador. And there's a, there's a set of sculptures, photographs, um, as well as videos, where performers are enacting the uh, gestures of labor that are um, performed well by, by workers in the rose industry, as well as uh, the shapes of sculptures that one can find in classical gardens commonly. And the last work in this part of the exhibition is by Miriam Simon, 
who collected the smell of a tiny, tiny plant uh, that only blooms one day a year for 24 hours. And this plant is on the verge of extinction. But due to a, uh, an error of how it was um, entered into systems of taxonomy, the plant is actually a legal fiction. What's interesting too is that this plant, um, our human noses cannot detect the smell. And nonetheless, Miriam collected the smell of the plant, synthesized it and changed it in a way that it becomes perceptible to our noses. And smell, of course, is really interesting for us because of the focus on sensing. And it is a, a perception that enters in a way more direct way into our bodies. Um, it is actually registered and processed in the same parts of the, of the brain where memory and emotions are processed. So to me, smell is, uh, is particularly interesting. And this work is beautiful in my mind. I think of it as poetry for a plant that's on the verge of extinction as plant and not as weed or not as a crop. At uh, Occurrence, we show the exhibition Rivers uh, Flowing Through Bodies by Candice Lynn and P. Staff and by Tao Nian Fan. And the exhibition looks at rivers and at other liquid bodies or bodies of water and how, uh, how toxins released into a water change the material realities, but also the spiritual realities of that river and of the bodies living on its shore. Um, or also the impact, for instance, in the case of uh, Peace Staff and Kenneth Lynn, of um, or the hormonal effects of plants on, on human bodies uh, and the knowledge of healers um, and witches and how that knowledge has been eradicated or attempted to be eradicated uh, by colonialism. Uh, Kenneth Lynn and Peace Staff, they propose a counter reading and they um, propose almost like a, it's like a mad scientist sort of laboratory where we have these tubes and they emit fog. Uh, there are several videos as well as these um, sheets of plexiglass where different stories are told about pollution, contamination, et cetera. So all about how the fluids and the liquids in our body are affected by not only our environments, but also by plants, by, you know, toxins and also by you know um, colonialism and by other human uh, histories and, it, and the impact of that can actually be felt directly on human bodies. Tony and Fan's film Becoming Alluvium is centered on the Mekong River where uh, she did research on several environmental uh, histories that affect human livelihoods on the shores of the river as well as mythologies. So for instance, uh, we're exhibiting also these, uh, these drawings for an animation that is part of the film that tells a story of a princess who wishes nothing more than jewelry made from, uh, from the sort of um, morning uh, dew or humidity on plants and the sort of failures and the fables as well as moral stories inherent to that. At the Museum of Fine Arts, we're exhibiting Anduki Jordan and her exhibition, Intimacy of Strangers. The title is borrowed from Donna Haraway and Lynn Magulis. Um, Lynn Magulis was an evolutionary biologist and Haraway is a um, well-known feminist philosopher. And both of them have put forward hypothesis of uh, that evolution is not so much based on competition, but much more on symbiosis or becoming together. So our involvement together with other organisms. And Duki has taken inspiration uh, from that and has, and we're showing the uh, a projection, which is actually titled uh, staying with the trouble in reference to Donna Haraway's work, where we follow all of these critters from beautiful sea slugs to microorganisms to monarch butterflies. And we, uh, we see sort of their interactions with one another and they tell 
a beautiful poetic narrative of cohabitation and symbiosis. Um, uh, Together with that, Duki is exhibiting these critters. Um, they're from her artificial stupidity series, and they are robotic creatures that move around in the space and they question this idea of artificial intelligence or that our technologies are going to help us out of the dire social and environmental crisis. And they say, well, perhaps we should dig deeper and actually reconsider our structures and rather than, um, than trying to solve our problems through new techno fixes. The artist Tuetanatsis Wise has created a garden for the Biennale, um, which is exhibited outside of the uh, Grand Library in the space, uh, in outside, um, outside the space of the library. And the garden is, uh, is mostly composed of indigenous plants, yeah, 90%, I would say, uh, from indigenous plants. And uh, the shape is inspired by the one dish, one spoon agreement. Um, and Seas has been coming back to Montreal and working with local youth who are helping to maintain the garden. Many of these plants have been given to her by other people and after the exhibition ends, will also be passed on to other people who will continue to take care of them and grow them. At Vox, the exhibition Wet Futures really focuses on the ocean and on the various um, histories that have been um, told through the waves and through the surface that has been crossed by ships for, of migration, um, including the atrocities of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we're looking at ecologies and we're also looking at speculative futures. The first work one encounters when entering the space is by Jen Bervin. Uh, it is called The Sea. It's a new work that we're showing, and it is based on John van Dyck's book, The Opal Sea from 1906. John van Dyck uh, was a naturalist and a writer um, and also an art historian who really focused on perception in his writing. And so the book is full of wonderful descriptions of the sea and various sea creatures. And Jen intervened in the writing through these stitches and sewing and um, and erased or hid some of the parts and lifted others uh, and emphasized those through the work. So it's a beautiful poetic uh, work that's exhibited um, on a long vitrine allowing or inviting viewers actually to read the parts that have been um, emphasized by Jen. Carolina Caicedo's water portraits continue also in this part of the exhibition. And um, in the back, you can see Ayesha Ahmed and Ahmedine Khan's In the Shadow of Our Ghosts, which is a video projection um, addressing contemporary migration as well as the Middle Passage. We follow a, an, anonymous, an anonymous figure whose face we never see, and we see only ever shapes of, of the body as well as shadows walking on the beach and uh, another voice holding a monologue and considering, you know, uh, temporary or contemporary migrations, um, as well as human rights issues and personal stories connected to the sea. And so here the politics of visibility are also really important. So for uh, refugees, for example, what would it mean to travel to traverse the sea? What does it do to your identity? Do you actually do you want to um, be seen or do you want to be hidden? And this question of visibility is also really uh, present in the work of Thema Igaras and Erin Sidal, who, uh, who I talked about for uh, the Galerie de Lucam and their work there. And this is the second part of the work where um, we actually see a 16 millimeter projection of film uh, taken at the Great Bear Leg. It is projected through a prism, which you can see between the projector and the, uh, the projection surface, and a water bottle. And the water uh, bottle contains water that was co uh, collected at the lake. And again, because of the way that the light is diffracted through the prism and through the water bottle, this, uh, this question of visibility is present. In this case, more connected to radioactivity 
and um, and pollution and you know the sort of radioactivity as a process that does affect bodies, human bodies, non-human bodies, bodies of water, uh, but it is not visible to our eyes. Susan Shipley's work, Learning from Ice, is a more documentary approach looking at the world's cryosphere based on her long-term research into ice cores and into how scientists can actually, uh, what they can tell from these cores that are extracted from permafrost. And together with that work, we're showing a newly commissioned uh, series of videos, uh, commissioned together with the Toronto Biennial as well. Uh, which is looking at ice and, uh, and temperature as a weapon. So on the one hand, looking at the so-called starlight tours, which are practices of policing in Canada where mostly indigenous people are taken outside in freezing temperatures and just dropped off outside of the city and um, very often die. So, um, and now in recent years, there have been more investigations into these practices, but for, for a long time, they weren't investigated. And so uh, together with forensic architecture and other collaborators, Susan Shipley has been looking into these cases and is tracing various cases on a map, telling the stories and telling also how the legal system has not been able to account for, um, for these deaths and uh, abandonments. Other cases include, for instance, uh, the, the cold temperatures in a detention center in the U.S. at the U.S.-Mexican border, uh, as well as questions of climate change and the right to be cold, among others. And these cases are actually available to see online. And you can see the link here in the top of the server. It's cold-cases.info. Maris Goudreau is a, an artist and a wildlife rehabilitator who has been fascinated with beluga whales all her life. In the Biennale, we are showing the video uh, Whale Listeners, where we follow several people on a boat in, uh, in the Arctic who are following whales and listening to them with hydrophones and then discussing what the songs mean to them and what they might mean to the whales. Uh, whale songs are interesting because they are actually evolving so there's almost like fashion among whales where the songs can yeah they, they transmute and they're passed on from one to the next and you can trace uh, in the ocean where whales have traveled and how songs have been passed on together with the video we're exhibiting this it's almost like a collector's curiosity cabinet where uh, a whale's spine photographs little sculptural objects and so on are, uh, are shown a bit like an old school natural history museum or a personal collection of somebody really fascinated with the whales. And the last work in this part of the Biennale is by Susanna Winterling, who created an opera uh, with sounds entirely composed uh, from the ocean. So they include waves and clicking sounds, the sounds of the sea turtle, krill, and so on. And together with the sounds, uh, she's exhibiting a almost like a diorama of computer generated imagery of a tiny, a tiny dinoflagellate uh, algae. These algae light up when disturbed. So when one swims uh, while they're active or if a boat moves through, through them, they light up. Um, and they create this wonderful, beautiful uh, spectacles at night in the ocean. However, with warming temperatures, uh, they are also toxic and they block light access to lower parts of the ocean. And so they can also be both a warning system and actually uh, yeah, an alarm that something in an ecosystem is off. And so this opera, which is, you know, a human uh, cultural invention, of course, is dedicated to and entirely created by tiny non-human ocean critters. At the uh, Leonard and Bina Allen Gallery, Beatriz Santiago Munoz is exhibiting uh, the show Poetic Disorder, composed of various uh, 16 millimeter projections in the work Binaral 
which follows a fisherman or it shows a sunset in Puerto Rico and in the Solomon Islands. And Binaral is really like a, yeah, an approach to, um, to observation and to trying to make sense of these sort of everyday quotidian moments, um, also amidst climate change. And um, the other work presented uh, Guzila shows the uh, aftermath of the hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico a few years ago. It was the largest triple hurricane system ever recorded. And again, it is about sense making and how to create sense in a very disordered world devastated by environmental disaster as well as by ongoing uh, imperialism. Together with this uh, film called Maché Salomon, which was filmed in a marketplace in Haiti where two protagonists are discussing the presence of uh, invisible forces or supernatural forces. And uh, in another work of which I don't have an image here, there's a spell uh, that is discussed, which was apparently cast by a shooting star. And uh, it was a spell cast against the military occupation in Puerto Rico, possibly uh, a spell able to expel the military. And so in Beatrice's work, it's always about um, the invisible forces and the sort of chaos and disorder and nonetheless an invisible a sense of, of um, meaning that is present or a search for meaning that is present in her work. It's a beautiful, very poetic and at the same time political exhibition. Another group exhibition, World Making Tentacles at the Fonderie Darling, uh, addresses or has its starting point with the fabled uh, creatures of unicorns, which are often considered to be uh, uh, deriving from Greek mythology. But uh, according to uh, Teja Shah's research, actually come from the Kutch Valley in India, dating to 3000 to 1800 before Common Era. Um, and so this exhibition then asks, okay, what about these fabled creatures such as unicorns that have accompanied human culture for so long and that are these hybrids between humans and, uh, and non-humans as well as uh, real and fabled creatures? What can we learn from those and what kind of worlds can we dream by looking at speculative fiction, by combining ancestral knowledge with technology? And um, yeah, by, by finding uh, practices that sort of uh, undo the uh, destructive relations of colonial uh, patriarchy. The exhibition begins with Julien Croiset, who is exhibiting uh, the sculpture that you can see in the center hanging from the ceiling, as well as a wallpaper and a video. The works all address capone pesticides, which are used in banana plantations in Guadeloupe, Martinique, and other places. Uh, they're illegal, um, but uh, now, um, but they are still polluting groundwater and land and are still affecting the livelihoods of people in the areas and beyond. So here it is again about um, trade relations, about uh, colonial intentionality, mostly by, um, you know, brought, for instance, uh, by Europeans to islands. And uh, the video is, it's like a music video with animations. It sounds, um, yeah, it's a, th there's a rhythm to it and it kind of reverberates in the space, but asks these very serious questions of what does Capone do to bodies? And it, it shows the decomposition of bodies and of the molecules. Um, in, uh, in the pesticide. Jamila Sabur has uh, an ongoing series called Mnemonic Alphabet, of which we're showing three new works, where she's bringing together uh, images with letters from the alphabet and words calling into question uh, the adequacy of our uh, of our alphabet and of our vocabulary to address natural phenomena. So for example, karst is a porous uh, material found uh, often near the sea. 
meteor run as a word that refers to something high up or uh, up in the air. So, you know, meteorite or meteorology derived from that word. And those words and letters are paired with imagery um, to really open up a space for reconsideration of the ways that we approach nature, the way that we name things. Teja Shah uh, has uh, in 2012 created a brilliant series of works called Between the Waves, where we follow eco-sexual beings as they interact with one another and uh, with the surrounding areas, among others, um, a landfill that you can see here or uh, underwater, uh, there are underwater scenes as well. Very often we see plastics and pollution, but nonetheless, these creatures are uh, creating pleasure and they're resisting the easy qualification of uh, what is beauty and what is not and they're proposing a sort of other potential future um, and here the the reference to the unicorns is present and these um, as you can see here these works are beautiful touching very sensual also very uh, very sad and they're very very powerful Tejal is also giving a workshop during the biennial titled, Is the Universe Queerer Than We Can Suppose? where they address questions of queerness and they've been practicing um, Buddhism and uh, permaculture. So they will bring all of these different aspects together. In Tabitha Rezel's Serious Inner Fire, uh, we see Afrofuturist goddesses uh, who um, are inspired by the elements of fire, uh, earth, uh, water, and air, and um, they are, you know, futuristic, uh, retro or Afrofuturistic proposals for different imaginaries that do not objectify uh, black femme bodies, but uh, but that actually celebrate uh, the um, the technological divine, um, and who also very. Um, who also, yeah, fight for, you know, on the left, you can see, for example, a uh, bitch better have my money. So it's also about re uh, reparations, about payment, about uh, decolonization um, of, of art spaces, as well as all other spaces. Sandra Mujinga uh, is, has been inspired by, um, by the camouflage tactics of various animals, so of jellyfish as well as elephants. And this series of sculptures, Nocturnal Kinship, they're large, larger than life uh, sculptures who look like these figures standing there in the space, wearing hoodies, looking at you. And so Sandra is also pointing to the uh, racialized um, iconography of the hoodie and the idea of threat and of you know what bodies actually need to be protected because of police violence. Uh, and so on. Together with this work, they show, uh, Sandra is showing another piece called Disruptive Pattern, where it is again about camouflage, about visibility and invisibility, where we see this uh, sort of liquidized uh, images of uh, bodies appearing and disappearing. The work by Charlotte Brathwaite is inspired by the writer Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower novel from 1993, where Butler imagines a dystopian uh, uh, future, um, which is actually set in 2024, so not long from now, where environmental destruction is, uh, you know, very advanced and where also the political system has completely collapsed as corruption, violence, and, um, and the character in the books, Lauren Olamina, imagines a religion called Earthseed, which is more of a spirituality, which connects, um, or it says that everything is change and based on change. So darkness gives way to light and lightness gives way uh, to darkness. And so Charlotte's work is inspired by, uh, by this book and is almost like a sort of homage to it where you know other worlds become possible because of change and where she's really asking what kind of change can we and do we want to create? Um, at Optica, uh, we've 
uh, invited Bush Gallery, uh, who are an indigenous collective of Gabriel Lerondel Hill, Peter Morin, and Tanya Villard to uh, make a carte blanche exhibition. So we uh, invited Bush Gallery to do whatever they wanted to do, and they decided to uh, exhibit work, ex exhibit works that were um, uh, made in the summer on Tanya Willard's land. Uh, they're mostly sun prints, and you can see here, for instance, uh, the, the line plants as monuments um, printed on pieces of a tent that was there it was blown away during a storm. Or here are drew pieces of uh, denim, um, photographs, again, pieces of fabric of a tent, and, uh, and here this garment, as well as videos that are showing the making of the exhibition. And together with the works, uh, Bush Gallery is also exhibiting its manifesto where it describes what Bush Gallery is. And it is an um, itinerant gallery that can take place um, anywhere. It can take place in an art center, but it can also take place outdoors and it can shift shapes. It can be movie watching uh, with trees, can be art, um, you know, laughing, having fun can be art, but they also address the ongoing racism in the contemporary art system and attempt to widen the definition of what art is and ask who is invited into these spaces. Caroline Monet and Laura Ottman are friends and artists who have collaborated on several occasions. And for this new commission, we invited them to create a new piece for the McCord Museum. Due to the pandemic, uh, the artists were not able to meet. So they developed a call and response method similar to that of some bird species where uh, they send, uh, in this case, messages, um, photos, film, sounds to one another and, uh, and responded to what the other person had sent them. And together they created this beautiful exhibition which really focuses on waves and patterns. Um, there's both these, uh, these graphic uh, works as well as, uh, as a video projection and a sound piece by, uh, by Laura which is present in the space. Jamila Sabur um, is an artist um, who has been looking into, uh, with this work, she has been looking into the topography of uh, uh, underwater that gives rise to a sound phenomenon known as the Rosby whistle. The Rosby whistle occurs every 120 days, um, and it is a sound that's emitted from the ocean floor because of the way that the floor, ocean floor is formed and then the waves running over the ocean floor, but it is only audible in space. And so um, it's a work consisting of several video projections um, where we can see here this uh, person with a sextant, you know, trying to sort of gauge their position. Um, on the left, there are these figures uh, in, uh, in the empty blue uh, space holding a rhombus shape. The rhombus shape comes from the lattice work in Jamila Sabur's mother's house in Jamaica, where we see uh, people interacting with the land and, you know, in a circle or walking on a piece of wood and you know trying to find their balance so this exhibition is really about again sense making engaging one's position in the universe in relation or with the help of uh, of technologies but also of stories and of memory at the Fondation Phi uh, together with the Musée d'Art Contemporain we commissioned Abbas Akban to uh, create a new work which resulted in the piece uh, Spill, which you can see here. So it's a large green screen with a pond landscape in the center. There's water running in the pond and the rocks are arranged in a way that is um, pleasant, but also uh, not spectacular. So really playing with this idea of what are our expectations our expectations of nature and what are our ideas of idealized nature which we can almost project onto this empty green screen, which can give rise to any idea and any image of nature that we might want. 
Leolia Schrage um, is exhibiting um, a work dealing with uh, ancestral ceremonial spaces, in this case inspired by Fei or the um, octopus god of war in Samoan mythology. Um, the, in the center of the installation, the fabrics, uh, they're sort of a reference to this octopus shape. They create a ceremonial space. Uh, there are um, traditional and contemporary symbols printed on the fabrics. And together with this, uh, Leoli is exhibiting uh, a video uh, centering indigi queer pleasure and forms of pleasure and care that have often been um, uh, or that have become taboo in the Pacific on Samoa and many other places due to uh, or when colonizers and missionaries arrived. So this exhibition is really about uh, indigenous queer um, resistance to these sorts of taboos and to uh, gender norms and also to ways of how nature is, uh, is treated and is considered as an outside and an other um, out there. And the neon signs um, say, this is a, a sign in Samoan which translates roughly to uh, the words of our ancestors as spoken in eternity. New Red Order is an artist collective consisting of Adam Khalil, Zach Khalil, ja uh, Jackson Polis, and Kite. And together they developed this project, The Last of the Lemurians at the Centre Clark, which uh, takes as a starting point the fake claims of theosophists that there was once a supercontinent called Lemuria stretching all the way from the east coast of Africa through the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And uh, based on the supercontinent, uh, proponents of the theory develop claims of um, essentially uh, settlers and white people having been the most indigenous people on this land. So it, it is a racist theory attempting to claim uh, access to land and ownership of land without having to, um, to confront the, the genocides and ongoing atrocities. Uh, against indigenous people. And so it's a, it's a sort of a satirical work where we can see this figure in the cave, which is potentially the cave where Lemurians originated. The uh, green uh, object is a reference to uh, the um, uh, reptilian myths. There's a, there's a crystal that we can see a uh, reference to new age and energy. And so, yeah, it's a humorous, uh, wonderful humorous uh, way to debunk these, uh, these claims to indigeneity by white people. At the Galerie B312, uh, we're showing Chloe Lum and Yannick Desranlo, who have taken inspiration in the writing of Clarice Lispector, as well as in her garden in Rio de Janeiro, where the artist conducted research for the exhibition. Uh, Lispector lived with uh, chronic pain, as does Lum, and, uh, and wrote in her stories, it's always a very sort of intense, a very physical, uh, feverish way of writing, of uh, trying to create worlds and make sense of the world um, in, which, in which she finds herself. And so the artist created a synthetic uh, garden um, with these sort of architectural elements that could also be crutches or uh, you know design elements to help hold up the garden and this idea of the garden and in this garden they're exhibiting a libretto dedicated to Lispector and to her writing. And this is the last work in the exhibition that I have to show. So I'll stop my video here and I'm happy to take any questions or comments if there are any. I wanna thank you all for watching and wish you a good night.